To this day, space stations are one of humanity's greatest feats. Imagine we, or at least the scientists, created an artificial structure placed in orbit and have the pressurized enclosure, power, supplies, and environmental systems necessary to support human habitation for extended periods. This is amazing. But the question is, how were space stations actually built, and would it be possible to build even larger space stations in the near future? To find out, let's go back a little bit into the past to see how exactly space stations were made. If you see a bright dot moving slowly across the black canvas of the heavens that is way too high to be an airplane but too steady to be a shooting star, that's the International Space Station. Visible from Earth with the naked eye, the International Space Station, or simply ISS, is a habitable satellite that serves as a microgravity laboratory in space. The International Space Station took 10 years and more than 30 missions to assemble. It's a result of unprecedented scientific and engineering collaborations among five space agencies representing 15 countries. The space station is approximately the size of a football field. It's a 460-ton permanently crewed platform orbiting 250 miles above Earth. To put that into perspective, it's about four times as large as the Russian space station Mir and five times as large as the U.S. Skylab. Before, the idea of a space station was just science fiction, existing only in our imaginations. It wasn't until the 1940s that it became clear the construction of such a structure might be attainable. Basically, the International Space Station was made through a partnership between European countries, represented by ESA, the United States NASA, Japan's JAXA, Canada's CSA, and Russia's Roscosmos. Simply put, it's a multi-nation construction project that is the largest single structure humans have ever put into space. Its main construction was completed between 1998 and 2011, although the station continuously evolves to include new missions and experiments. The ISS is not owned by one single nation and is a cooperative program between the respective countries' agencies. The International Space Station costs about $3 billion per year for NASA to operate, which is roughly a third of the human spaceflight budget, according to the agency's Office of the Inspector General. So how did such a humongous man-made object even get into space? It would be impossible to launch such a huge object with modern technology. That's why the ISS was built slowly, piece by piece, in space. The first piece, Russia's Zarya module, was launched into space in 1998. Over time, other modules were launched via rockets in the United States Space Shuttle program. Astronauts connected all the pieces throughout several missions. Since that time, more than 200 astronauts from 15 different countries have visited the ISS. Space agencies hope to continue to use the ISS for many years to come. In fact, there are current plans to add even more pieces to the space puzzle in the upcoming years. On that note, let's talk about how a much bigger space station can be made well into the future. As a sneak peek at that, we can take a look at the movie Elysium for reference. In that movie, Earth is beyond repair and the rich and powerful have decided to leave it behind. Instead of three to six highly trained astronauts circling the Earth in an orbiting laboratory as there are today, the Elysium space station serves as an oasis for those who can afford it. In the film, humanity has developed a large rotating space station above a dystopian Earth by the year 2154. The station comes stocked with mansions, grass, trees, water, and gravity. You might say that that kind of brave new world sounds far-fetched, and it might be. Who knows? but the space station's design and the science behind it definitely isn't. The premise is totally believable to me. Mark Uron, former director of the International Space Station Division and NASA's Office of Human Exploration and Operations said, When I look at the Elysium Space Station, I thought to myself, that's certainly achievable in this millennium. Now, the actual process of building an Elysium-like space station would require some major advances in humanity's ability to live in space for an extended period of time, and it might not be able to happen in 150 years. No, that's probably too short of a time. Contrary to the movie's timeline of 150 years, it would probably take more than that, at least 500 years from now, if I had to take a guess. For one, scientists would need to develop a new kind of propulsion that could haul enough material into orbit to create a huge Elysium-like station. In order to fit that much mass into orbit, or even to go retrieve it from asteroids or mine it on the moon, you probably couldn't do it with chemical propulsion, Uran said. In terms of artificial gravity, Uran thinks that it's possible that a space agency will want to develop a space station with artificial gravity sometime in the future. At the moment, NASA astronauts adapt to life in microgravity instead of engineering gravity in a space environment. In the absence of the effects of gravity, 
If we don't do anything about it, very quickly our muscles get very weak and even our bones start to dissolve away. Faced with numerous and seemingly endless major obstacles in creating a sustainable space station colony, scientists thought of something else. In fact, they unveiled a bold plan to turn an asteroid into a space station. Although the basic idea of turning an asteroid into a rotating space habitat has existed for a while, it always seemed relatively far off regarding technologies, so the concept hasn't received much attention over the years. David W. Jensen, a retired technical fellow at Rockwell Collins, released a 65-page paper that details a plan to turn an asteroid into a space habitat. Dr. Jensen's paper tackled three main categories, asteroid selection, habitat style selection, and mission strategy to get there. In fact, that's not the only thing we can use asteroids for, as the consequences of environmental degradation and national resource depletion become increasingly severe. Scientists are placing a greater emphasis on not only sustainability utilizing the resources that we already have, but also on identifying new methods of obtaining resources. For example, scientists are pursuing novel but contentious resource extraction technologies, and one particular suggested solution is asteroid mining. Anyway, going back to an asteroid-made space station, Dr. Jensen pointed out the importance of finding which asteroid would make the best candidate to be transformed into a rotating space habitat. Considerations for this part include what the asteroid is made out of, its proximity to Earth, and its overall size. The next thing Dr. Jensen identified as part of the process of creating a bigger space station is the mission strategy, which is basically how astronauts will travel to and from the creation site. Now, that's where lunar industrial facilities come in. These are basically interplanetary vehicles. In 100 years or so, interplanetary space vehicles, with rotation for gravity and water and other shielding materials for radiation, will be needed for various reasons including the creation of a space station colony. Simply put, interplanetary vehicles will function as such, a vehicle to travel from one planet to another. What's more, these vehicles will be designed in a manner to enable asteroid mining. More importantly, these vehicles will be designed for decades of use in free space, just as ships on the Earth have been for thousands of years. That said, orbital shipyards will be necessary to make this happen. It's basically a shipyard in lunar orbit for the construction of humanity's first truly interplanetary space vehicles as well as providing the materials for very large Earth-orbiting space platforms for science and commerce. We believe that in 500 years or so, a lunar industrial site and orbital shipyards will no longer be a figment of imagination, but an actual existing and functioning space structure that will benefit humanity and the years to come. Speaking of the future, here's what you can expect in a futuristic Martian city. And I would just like to say, Thank you for choosing to spend your time with us today. We'll see you in our next video.